This episode of The Energy Show is proudly sponsored by Sunlight & Power, the Bay Area's leading commercial and residential solar contractor. SLP has been designing and installing photovoltaic, battery backup, and solar thermal solutions since 1976. Help fight climate change. Go solar with Sunlight & Power today. So, you want to save the world with clean energy? Make money doing it? Confused about the economic and technical realities of residential and commercial solar, batteries, heat pumps, EVs? Want the real world scoop on new energy technologies, not manufacture hype? Then tune in to the weekly energy show hosted by Barry Cinnamon. Insights from Barry's 40 plus years in the solar and energy industry will help you understand the future ways we'll generate and consume energy. And now here's Barry. Welcome to this week's Energy Show. Now, in celebration of Independence Day, July 4th, today, we're going to be talking about the realities of energy independence. Now, energy independence in general means that you're able to produce more energy than you consume. And we can look at this from the perspective of the country or an individual. And independence means that you don't really depend on any entity for the energy we need to live and work. And by the way, I'm writing this show when it's expected to be over 100 degrees for most of this upcoming week, 4th of July week. Another hottest summer ever. And that means record electric bills. Not only record kilowatt hours, but record total electric bills because the electric rates have gone up so much. And if you have energy independence, it means that you're not at the mercy of your utility for these sky high electric bills. So we're going to dig into this. What does energy independence mean in 2024 for the U.S. and for homeowners? Now, for the U.S., we generate more energy than we consume. Now, to a large degree, this is a result of record oil and gas production. Drill, baby, drill really did happen. It took a while. But over the last few years, the U.S. is net independent of total energy. We still export a lot of oil and gas, and we import some refined fuels, but we export more than we import. Therefore, we're basically, you know, theoretically energy independent. Now, the kind of the dilemma is, got to keep in mind, there's a global price market for oil and gas. It's a commodity, crude oil, refined products like gasoline and natural gas. So when the world prices go up, U.S. oil and gas producers are going to do the natural capitalistic thing. They're going to ship more to the customers that want to pay the most. That's going to increase the price of the pump. They're not going to say, oh, there's a shortage of gas and there's a shortage of natural gas. We're going to keep all that in the U.S. so that our pump prices are low. Now, that's not what happens. It goes overseas. And so the dilemma is so having this net production independence of gasoline and natural gas and oil does not really shield us from price shocks. Oil companies make more money when the world price of oil goes up and they don't care about keeping prices low at the pump. Right, so that's where the, the main sources of the fuel come from. Now, let's look at the sources of electricity. And this is some more graphs from the Energy Information Administration in the U.S. So they're pretty good. They've gotten much better. They used to really totally over underestimate the growth of solar and wind and renewables. And, and now I think they're kind of on target, even though their plans show that renewables are going to grow like crazy. We'll talk about that in a minute. But looking at the current sources of electricity, looking at those trend lines over the past 20 years or so, coal is clearly on a downward trend, just simply based on cost. Coal is a very, very cheap fuel, but it's very, very expensive to make clean coal. And basically utilities are saying, hey, we're going to put in natural gas if we need to base load power, and we're not going to spend a ton of money on cleaning up dirty coal emissions. So coal is on a downward trend. That's going to go away. Natural gas, it's kind of interesting. It's been growing steadily as coal has been declining, but it's kind of leveled off. So natural gas is still by far and away the most convenient fuel for generating electricity. There's gas pipelines everywhere, and they're putting in a lot of new kind of miniature natural gas plants that are called peaker plants for utilities. And these little smaller natural gas generators are there when solar and the wind production tails off and, and towards the end of the day going into the evening, and we have spikes of demand for electricity. Natural gas turbines can start up and provide that extra fuel, that extra electricity is needed at those peak times. So natural gas is still pretty much on a run, and it's also 
really a good fuel for nighttime energy and winter energy. The dilemma for natural gas is that with all the renewables that are coming out, with all the sunlight during the day and all the wind that's available, we don't need as much as we used to. Now, there's also a really interesting transition that I think is going to happen in probably about 10 years when it's really going to hit its stride is natural gas is also used very, very frequently for industrial processes and it pollutes. The solution really is using something called green hydrogen and that's hydrogen that's generated from solar and wind basically by electrolyzing water. Take the water, run some electricity through it, you get oxygen coming off and you get hydrogen coming off, you capture that hydrogen. Not super duper efficient, but Because the solar power and the wind power can be so inexpensive, it is a really good way to generate that fuel. And hydrogen is a good fuel for transportation and industrial processes. So interesting how natural gas is going. It's going to level off. I don't think it's going to continue to go up very quickly. Nuclear, it's flatlining. It looks like it had a heart attack. And the problem with nuclear is it takes so long to build those plants. The last plant, it was, I think, in Georgia, the Voltley plant. It took over 20 years to build, and the price was like double of what they expected. I mean, $20 billion or something. It was kind of insane. So utilities have basically said, hey, we're not going to plan for new nuclear plants because they take so long, 20 years, and they're so expensive, so many increases in price. They might as well just wait until we have more solar and batteries because solar and batteries right now are much cheaper. It's just a matter of kind of ramping that up. Now, nuclear has a huge benefit that it's really a good baseline provider of power. When we're talking about baseline, that's providing power night and day, you know, hot, cold, in the middle of the winter, in the middle of the night. Very, very good for that. The problem is that the nuclear plants are just so darn expensive. We've got a lot of these ideas of small modular nuclear reactors. There's a lot of those under development, and they're kind of moving ahead, but not a single one has been permitted yet. And bizarrely, they require a special kind of imported uranium that pretty much only Russia is making. So transitioning to these small nuclear reactors, which could be a good idea, it's going to take a long time. And we have to kind of figure out what the fuel cycle is going to be, where we're going to get that fuel, because there's no supply chain for that fuel at this point. So when you keep looking at this graph and you're seeing how renewables are going up, and then to the right of that graph, you see zooming in on what's happening with those individual sources of renewables, wind, solar, hydro, biomass, geothermal, by far and away, it's mostly solar and wind. And when you kind of look at that graph and you see how fast solar is accelerating, it's steepening. The wind is kind of tapered off a little bit. Hydro's flat, maybe going down a little bit because we're not building a lot of new dams. Geothermals are also very flat. Geothermals, from a utility scale standpoint, their plants can be pretty good, but they're going to take a long time to build also. They're going to need transmission lines, and there's only a few places around the country that has really good sources for your geothermal power. But there are some companies working on that. But you look at the rate of increase of solar. That's the path we need to follow. That's the path that's growing fast enough for us to meet all the energy demands that we need. We're not going to kind of get out of this situation by following the nuclear path because it's flatlined and it's going to take 20 years before the next plant gets built. Geothermal is not going to do it. Biomass is really not going to be able to scale. The ones that are going to scale are solar and wind, and solar is clearly winning the race. I just kind of took a look at some of the other information out there. We installed 33 gigawatts of solar panels in 2023. I think 20 years ago, we didn't even install it one gigawatt. Now, out of that 33 gigawatts, about 20 gigawatts, about two-thirds of it were imported. 33 million panels were imported. So we're not, we're, we can be independent with solar generation, but we're going to be importing the equipment, the solar and the wind turbines, solar panels and the wind turbines to become independent. It's going to be a challenge. So we are working a lot in the U.S. as part of the IRA and other plans to build factories to manufacture the solar panels and wind turbines. But it's the way to go. Solar panels are really cheap. Even if we get them from China, it's going to solve our energy problems. But we will have to figure out how to start making those things, you know, completely cost effectively on our own. All right. Now, talking about this energy independence goal from the U.S. standpoint, The transition to electric vehicles is going to help tremendously with our energy independence goals because we're going to generate that electricity from domestic solar and wind. And therefore, our transportation sector, which is one of the biggest consumers of oil and gas, is going to be less susceptible to global oil and gas price swings. It's very inexpensive to generate the electricity we need for cars, and we clearly can generate all electricity from solar and wind domestically here in the U.S. So as we move towards EVs, as we move towards school buses and light trucks and everything else using EVs, it's going to make a tremendous difference. Now, there's still going to be a dilemma 
because we're still going to need fuel for trucking and for long distance air transport, but that could be resolved eventually with green hydrogen, as we mentioned before. All right. So kind of looking at it from an overall standpoint, the U.S. is relatively energy independent. We're doing okay. We export more energy than we import. And we still will have price shocks due to world oil prices. Solar is growing extremely fast, and we are kind of working on solving that problem of making our own domestic solar panels. But and we made a tremendous amount of progress. So now looking at where we're generating electricity from these different fuels, natural gas, nuclear, coal, etc., as we generate more electricity from solar and wind, we're going to be using less oil and gas for transportation, and also we're going to be using less oil and gas for heating. The heating's going to transition to heat pumps. And as we switch to EVs and heat pumps, the mix of energy sources in the U.S. is going to change. As you can see in this graph, we're going to be using more renewables, more of the green stuff. We're still going to be using natural gas, but we're going to be using much less of the coal and the, the nuclear and the other fuels. So that's going to make a tremendous difference. Now, we still, as I mentioned, have issues and, and problems with finding renewable fuels for planes and long-haul trucking. Yes, we can make renewable jet fuel, kerosene, in some renewable way, but it's going to be really expensive. It's not going to be until we have really good, inexpensive green hydrogen that planes are going to actually be able to fly based with hydrogen fuel. And the same thing for long-haul trucking. You can't put batteries in long-haul trucks. That's why you can't put batteries in planes. They're just too heavy. So you end up hauling the batteries instead of hauling the freight. Same thing with as with planes, you're going to be able to use green hydrogen for that eventually. So I'm very optimistic for the plans to use green hydrogen. It's going to be the fuel for industrial processes like making cement and steel, and it's going to be the fuel for planes and all trucking. So that's where we're at from a U.S. standpoint. Now, you're probably wondering, what am I going to do with my house? Yeah, it's really good that the U.S. is energy independent, but I'm still paying through the nose for my electricity. What can you do? All right, so in terms of full energy independence from a homeowner standpoint, one thing that people talk about, they like to do, they want to cut the cord completely with the utility. That's called grid defection. Basically, you're not going to be using the electric grid anymore. You say to the utility, take out my meter, stop billing me, go away, I'll kind of figure it out. Now, you can do that. It could be done. It's going to be a little bit inconvenient. It's going to be like a cabin in the woods. But if you have a big solar system, you have right batteries and perhaps a gas generator for emergencies, you could be fine. I could probably do it in my house with a couple more batteries and a gas generator for emergencies. But I generally don't recommend grid defection, canceling that utility connection, because the utility connection is handy to have. When, let's say, you've got to charge up a couple of EVs quickly, or you need to heat your house at night in the winter during a storm when your storage batteries are depleted. So it is kind of handy to have that cord with the utility to have that, as long as it's priced reasonably. And as the utilities make those prices more based on... (laughs) based on income or really, really high flat fees, you're going to see people saying, screw it, I'm not going to pay $50 a month to the utility or $600 a year. I'm just going to buy a generator and add to my solar system, and I'm going to be fine. So they're really walking a pretty fine line there that it's going to be difficult to maintain that business model because with solar, a generator, and batteries, you're going to be fine. And we'll see how that evolves. Now, instead of full grid defection, we can almost always economically do something called partial grid defection. That's put in a good-sized solar system or even a small one, put in a battery. If you size it right, you can dramatically reduce your electric bill. You can almost always do that. And you can even zero the bill out with the right mix of solar and batteries. So that's partial grid defection. You're not cutting the cord, but you're going to be buying a heck of a lot less from the utility. So it's very easy, as I mentioned, to reduce the cost. Just put a small solar and battery system in. You're going to reduce your peak electric costs in the evening if you have a battery. So maybe put a solar system in that's big enough to charge up a 20 kilowatt hour battery every day. You're not going to have to pay through the nose for really expensive electricity in the late afternoon and the evening. Yeah, you'll still pay for some electricity at night during off-peak times. You'll still try and you have to buy electricity from utility, but you charge your car at night between, you know, here in California, between midnight and 3 p.m., and it's relatively cheap. So you're going to dramatically lower your electric bill. And this partial grid defection concept with an appropriately sized solar system and batteries is almost always the most economical system design. Now, you can get 
a zero or even a negative electric bill. There's some customers that we have that actually get a check back from their utility every year because they generate more power than they use. The utilities are kind of cracking down on those specific rates, so it's tougher to do that in California right now, but in other places you can. And, you know, there may also be ways you can do that with a virtual power plant and the right size batteries, but you're always going to need a bigger system. It may not be fully economical to dramatically oversize the system to get to that zero bill, but Hey, yeah, I'm a big supporter there. But I would still say, hang on to that utility connection. Don't completely cut the cord. And so here's kind of the long-term issue with solar and batteries and when it comes to the utility business model. Utilities hate partial grid defection. And it will kill them if many, many customers completely defect from the grid. And they're stuck between a rock and the hard place. The rock is that it's getting cheaper and cheaper for customers to generate their own power. And we're getting closer and closer to where partial grid defection, where you can generate you know, two-thirds of your energy use, including heating, electricity, and driving from solar. So you're getting to that point. So that's the rock. The hard place is the utilities have a business model where they make a huge profit based on their assets. And as more and more people partially defect from the grid, have more and more solar, their planning process gets, there's a huge monkey wrench that gets thrown into that. They have planned on building more power plants and transmission lines, but now based on that phenomenal growth, they may not need it because the customers are putting in their own mini power plants on the roof. Homeowners win, businesses win, utilities lose. That's why utilities are taking every tactic they can figure out to Make it more expensive and less feasible for customers to generate their own power. They have a monopoly and they're flexing their muscles to exclude us. But you can be much more energy independent with the right system design. Here's my advice for home energy independence. You want to address three key issues. The first one is electricity generation. That's where you're going to use solar and you're going to put a storage battery in so that You can avoid those really high rates later in the afternoon and in the evening. Batteries make a lot of sense because often the power is unreliable because utilities are no longer doing that metering. And PG&E is a poster child on that here in California. They have very unreliable power, blackouts all the time, especially in areas that are, you know, not really in the middle of a city. And they've eliminated net metering. So you really get negligible credits for selling power back to the utility in the middle of the day. So what do you do? You're going to buy a battery and you're going to keep that power for use at night. So eventually the utilities are going to have the same problem. So the first thing to think about, I'm not saying it's the first thing you implement, the first thing to think about is putting in a solar and storage system so you can generate your own power day and night. The second is pretty straightforward. It's energy conservation, making your home more energy efficient. Do simple things to reduce your energy usage. Huge change in the U.S. when it comes to home energy use when everybody transitioned to LED lights. They used to be expensive. Now they're the same price as a regular light bulb, but in many cases, you can't even replace those light bulbs. So putting in LED lights everywhere, they make light bulbs that fit in almost every single application. It'll be a huge savings. We have some customers that still have, you know, really incandescent, high energy use lights in certain places. And, you know, it's just, they can reduce their energy use tremendously by swapping out those 65 watt or 80 watt bulbs with something that's going to only use five watts. Way, way better. So uh, LED lights, no brainer. Insulation, making sure that your home is appropriately insulated. It's hard to insulate the walls, but usually you can do more for the attic, the ceilings, and that's going to really help. Make sure you have efficient heating and cooling systems. There's no duct leakage. You have new equipment, good windows and doors. So that's minimizing air leakage. And then the last thing, which is pretty easy, we call it eliminating vampire loads. And you try and go around your house and see all the little gadgets that are plugged in 24 seven. And boy, that can really, really add up. So do those straightforward energy conservation things. And then the last thing that you should look at or plan for, you may do these things in different orders, is put in high efficiency appliances. Electrify your home with a heat pump HVAC system, with a heat pump water heater, put in an induction cooktop. Obviously, many people are talking about putting an EV, so you're going to put an EV and you're going to put an EV charger. And you're going to completely eliminate the usage of fossil fuels in their homes. It's going to be cheaper if you generate that electricity from solar, definitely cheaper. And you're going to come still out ahead if you're still buying power from the utility. And it's going to be a lot cleaner, a lot safer. The one, the place where it's really dramatically, a lot of the studies show this, is the induction cooktops, since you're not actually burning natural gas in the middle of your house, it ends up being a lot cleaner, a lot safer, 
people are healthier, you don't have as much childhood asthma, huge, and the cooking experience, unless you're using a really high-powered wok, the cooking experience is just terrific. So here's kind of summarizing things. Don't try and do all of this energy-independent stuff at once, unless you have a good-sized budget. You can get plenty of good advice on how to electrify your home and become energy independent on the internet. Lots of websites that kind of point you in that right direction. My advice is to find an experienced local contractor who can help. It's going to be hard to find a contractor that kind of knows how to do everything. So you're going to want to talk to a solar and battery storage expert for the generation side. You're going to want to talk to an HVAC company for a heat pump. But be careful when you pick that HVAC company. Don't settle for a company that's just going to say, oh, We're just going to replace that old AC compressor because it's going to be cheaper that way. Or your furnace died. We're just going to put it in another furnace. Don't worry about it. But you're never going to break that cycle. So it's much better to bite the bullet when either your AC compressor dies or your furnace dies. That's when you put in a heat pump. You've got to find a plumber to put in a heat pump water heater. And when your hot water heater dies, it's that tank that's sitting in your garage or in your basement. You see a puddle on on the basement or the garage floor. That's the time that you're going to put in a heat pump water heater. And, you know, make sure you're talking to a plumber that knows what they're talking about. And you're going to spend a little bit more, but they're offset by incentives. Spend a little bit more to get the solution that's going to really save you a lot of money over the long term. And then you're going to have to find an electrician to rewire your home as needed for an EV charger, for an induction cooktop. Sometimes if you don't have air conditioning and you're putting in a heat pump HVAC system, you're going to need an extra circuit for that. And sometimes, depending on the heat pump water heater you're going to get, you may also need a separate 240-volt circuit. But your plumber and your electrician should be able to help with that. Now, when it comes to this whole concept of electrification and becoming energy independent, there's some companies who provide good consulting services. Their advice is usually pretty good. They'll help you come up with a plan, and they'll help you find contractors. The key thing with these companies is make sure they're going to give you very specific advice based on your own energy consumption. That's based on your utility bill, based on your current equipment. And it's also really important that they know the local incentives. They know the realities of those local incentives. So a lot of times people say, hey, average energy use for somebody in the U.S. is this. The average incentive is that. Here's what you should do. Well, those averages are not, I guarantee you, they're not going to apply to you. So you want to find some companies that's going to give you advice, whether it's consultant or contractors, that really know the local situation. And the other thing is that some of these consultants, I mean, they, they may charge you some money up front. If they don't, they're going to get paid with by contractors that actually do the work because they'll help you line up some contractors. So there'll be commissions or finder's fees in there. You're not getting, generally not getting this advice for free. You're going to end up working with multiple contractors. Now, there are a few around the country, a few local contractors who specialize in home electrification. That's something that we do here at Cinnamon Energy Systems, but there's other companies that are kind of starting to do this. In my view, they may be your best bet for energy independence. They're going to be contractors that have solar experience, electrical experience, HVAC experience, that kind of know the number crunching, that have a, a good reputation, that have a good designers that can help you. So those are the people that I would also talk to. I'm not saying just exclusively go with them, but I would have a discussion with them so that they can help you put together a plan and kind of go step by step on how you can become energy independent and how you can avoid, boy, I cringe when I think of how high everybody's electric bills are going to be in June and July of 2024. It's going to be insane. Anyway, that's all the time we have on this week's Energy Show. Thanks to all of our listeners for tuning in. And if you missed any of today's show, you can go to the Energy Show website at energyshow.biz and listen to the podcasts. This episode of The Energy Show was proudly sponsored by Sunlight and Power, the Bay Area's leading commercial and residential solar contractor. SLP has been designing and installing photovoltaic, battery backup, and solar thermal solutions since 1976. Help fight climate change. Go solar with Sunlight and Power today.